Welcome to Tuesday Talks with Shawnee Alliance Church. Each week we gather to discuss how being a follower of Jesus impacts our everyday lives. Whether you have been a believer for a long time or still have lots of questions about faith, we would love to have you join us as we embrace the joy of a transformed life. Hey friends, we just wanted to give you a heads up before this episode starts that due to the nature of the conversation, we suggest that you listen to this episode first to decide what content is best to share with your family and children. We are believing that your heart would be encouraged and your soul would be set free by these words. Hope you enjoy. Alrighty, hello, welcome back to another week of Tuesday Talks. My name is Bridget and I will be your host. And on today's episode, week three of our summertime romance series, I have Cole and Kate Zick. Summertime romance. Oh hello, God. hello. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. It's uh, a new new day of doing these through Zoom, but it's uh, made everything more accessible. Yes, it has. So glad to have you guys here. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about the meaning of marriage. We spent the last couple weeks talking about singleness and dating, and now we're just going to have an awesome conversation about marriage and what God has designed for it. So my first question for you guys, it's kind of a fun question. And if you could describe your first year of marriage in three words, what would it be? Oh, do do we have to have the same three words or do we each? No, you each get three words. That's a great question. I don't know. That's that's mine. That's my answer. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I'll go ahead and use that as my answer. Oh my gosh, (laughs) I'm trying to remember it. You want to go first? I just went. I don't know. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. No, that's a cop-out. You got to give me the real ones. Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Mine will be um, fun, lingerie, and... What marriage were you in? Ministry. <laughs> because it was the Perfect. only year the lingerie lasted. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's funny. Um, I do not remember our first year through the filter of lingerie. <laughs> so, you do? No. I do. I didn't even know you owned any lingerie. <laughs> it's been a while. I haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> who are you putting on? No, I'm just joking. Um, all right. My three words besides, I don't know, since I already gave an answer that feels applicable, okay. I'll give you new ones. Definitely ministry. Yeah. Cause we di- dove right in right away. Um, Ministry, peace. Mm-hmm. So much more peaceful when we didn't have children. <laughs> <laughs> so quiet. <laughs> and ministry, peace, and tranquil. Our condo that we lived in, oh like we walked out to the like water and the it ducks. Was. It had this like bubbling creek outside. Yeah. It Fun. Was That's like just my first reaction memories of our first year. Yeah, I just think of our first place. It was like cheap furniture, but nice. Free free furniture, (laughs) tiny little one bedroom apartment, (laughs) and ducks outside. Love that. Funny, funny. So as we kind of continue in our conversation, we are going to kind of loop back, and I would love to have you guys give some advice for people. Right now we're in summer, and so we do have a lot of people getting married. And so I want to prompt my engaged friends of, hey, like what are some tips and tricks you have for – newly married people. We're going to come back to that. My first question for you, um, we live in a world that a lot of people, uh, especially young people, have been given this narrative that marriage is just a piece of paper, that it's just something people do. And so from God's perspective, like he sees marriage as covenant. And so why is marriage more than just a piece of paper? Mm-hmm. It's bad for me to go first, because if I go first, I like don't stop sometimes. It's okay. Um, no, I think that's probably, a, it's a super critical question to answer for this generation. And, you know, studies are, uh, tons of studies have begun to demonstrate millennials have lost their faith in marriage. It'll be the least married generation of any generation. They're getting married much later in their life than they ever have. And not all of that attributes to lack of trust in marriage. Some of that attributes to, to trying to get their jobs secure, their careers, things of that nature. Um but when you're, when you're really trying to understand marriage, I would go so far. I'm going to make a big statement right now. I think that marriage is the absolute best way to understand God through. 
And that's a big statement because I'm not trying to marginalize singles who feel called to singleness, right? Like that, that's not the intent of what I'm trying to say. But when you look at scripture, there's this constant illustration that the Lord is giving that parallels marriage and his desired relationship to us. He calls himself the bridegroom. We're the bride. He talks about in Ephesians how husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church, giving himself up for her. So there's this constant illustration woven throughout scripture of humans. I, God, want to have such a deep, intimate, fully open, fully exposed relationship with you. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's going to be really hard for you to understand what I want you to have. So let me actually give you husband and wife so that you can understand the connection, the intimacy and the depth that I want to have with you. And then I will start referring to this marital relationship so you can understand my relationship with you. Right. It's why he made Adam and Eve without clothes because he desires full vulnerability with us, full openness. He desires there to be no walls, no, Nothing created, no barriers that prevent us from depth with each other. And so when you get into the context of marriage right now, what's going on in our generation is people have become very terrified of full exposure. I don't want people to really know who I am. So marriage seems terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I would say people haven't, aren't even entering into marriage with the full level of openness that the Lord has intended for them to enter into. And that's created a lot of breakdown in our marital structure and therefore our family structure and then therefore our societal structure where we're no longer entering into, hey, I'm with you till death do us part. Like there is nothing that's going to separate us. I'm with you. I'm going to fully expose myself to you the way you're going to fully expose yourself to me. And because we're so fully exposed, the only place to have full exposure is in a covenant safe relationship. Yeah. When I'm not committed to this piece of paper I signed, or a lot of people that don't even that live together and aren't even married at all, right? I mean, that's like common everywhere now. Um, what's going on now is I'm in an unsafe relationship because I actually don't know when you're going to leave. And there may get to a point where you're going to take off because I've not done enough of the right things, or I've done too many of the wrong things. Covenant protects relationship. People think it, it binds them and it holds them down. It actually protects it. And so the Lord is looking at us saying, hey, let me show you what I want. A healthy, committed covenant marriage is actually what I want with you, where I can finish her sentences and I know what she needs and vice versa. All of a sudden now, not only am I in a powerful, strong, healthy relationship, I can actually better understand God now. Mm -hmm. Now I know how the father feels about me. Now I know the love that he has for me. I mean, when I deeply in love with her, I'm more willing to sacrifice for her, mm -hmm. right? Like I would give up anything to save her life. If she had cancer and the Lord came to me and said, what do you want me to do? Give the, if, give the cancer to me and let her live. That would, I wouldn't even think about that mm -hmm. because of the depth of covenant here. When you're not in a covenant relationship, you're not willing to lay your life down for somebody because you, you already haven't laid your life down for them. You've yeah. created and managed safety, yeah. right? Most of our relationships in our generation are about, well, find someone that makes you happy. They're, they're so centered around this idea of self-fulfillment, self-satisfaction, self-gratification. Find, find the yeah. person that makes you the happiness and then date them or marry them. Well, that's not what covenant relationship's about, right? Like covenant relationship is about, I'm going to do everything I can to lay my life down for your fulfillment, your joy, your happiness. Um, and so you, when you get into this, you know, more than a piece of paper, unfortunately, I don't know that marriage is that much more than that in our generation. Now it was meant to be, it was God's design for it to be God, God designed it so that, and, and, and my last thing, I'll let Kate jump in here. I think it's why our generation is so confused about the Lord. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're so confused mm -hmm. about who God is because they don't have the living illustration that he meant for us to have to understand him through. We don't have the filter of covenant committed marriage because our marriages are falling apart. Our mm -hmm. marriages are riddled with pornography. They're riddled with marital unfaithfulness. 
They're not built on understanding, compromise, healthy communication. They're more riddled with anger, yelling, abuse. I mean, when you think about the narrative of what marriage is, it, it, it doesn't give you, if I looked at God through the perspective of current modern day marriage, at least what's portrayed through media, mm-hmm. I would have a really hard time understanding God if this is the illustration he gave us to understand him through, yeah. right? And so now we look at marriage and we, yeah, it is a piece of paper because we're so confused. Why? Because true covenant requires sacrifice by both parties. Mm-hmm. We're not really willing to sacrifice for God or for each other. We really like the idea of an easy gospel. Mm. God, be my vending machine. Do what I need you to do when I push in the buttons and I pray the prayers. That's what that's the relationship I want with God. And I'll come back to you next time I need something. Mm-hmm. And so when that's our, our, our approach to the Lord, that becomes our approach in relationships. And before we know it, we actually don't know how to have healthy relationships or healthy connection to the Lord or each other. Sorry, mm-hmm. I just went along. No, it's good. I love that. I think even like that narrative of self-protection too. We've been so taught that of just letting people in. I think that's something that even for single people, like you don't just jump into marriage and all of a sudden you're ready to be vulnerable with somebody. Like you have to have a discipline of vulnerability, what that means to actually let people see you and to let let them in and to um, go through that process of, do you actually know how to get your needs met? Like, do you know how to invite people into intimacy with you? Um, But we live in this, like, let me just wear a mask. I, I mean, well, all the terrible things COVID has brought up, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful the Holy Spirit said to me, he's like, you know, people have walk, been walking around with masks for a long time. Now we just see them on the outside. <laughs> so now we just call it out like, oh, look, it's kind of that, you know, that remembrance. Well, um, think about how counter, I mean, what you just said is so right on because you think about how contrary marriage is to every other relationship in your life. Think about high school. What are most people focusing on in high school? Faking it so everybody likes them. Mm-hmm position myself to be liked because I've got to be popular. Then they go to college and they're trying to figure out what click in college they fit into. It's too big to really be popular, but I got to find my group. And so I still, again, I retailer myself to be liked and valued by people. And then we get into social media. We're living for people's likes and approvals on social media. And all of a sudden now I'm supposed to flip a switch and do relationship completely different. I'm supposed to be totally self-exposed totally open, totally, totally vulnerable. Here's all of me. We don't even know how to show all of us. Absolutely. Until we have taught ourselves how to do it through scripture and risky conversations where I'm going to take a big risk. I'm going to let you see more of me and more of me and more of me and more of me risking that you might not like what you see. I just spent 22 years of my life faking who I was so that I'd be liked by every group I'm in. Mm. We've been very ill-equipped to be in marriage because so much of our time has been spent creating a facade to be liked and valued by people whose opinions really don't even matter. Yeah. Sorry, that was a tease. It's good. It's good. Rabbit trail. It's good. Babe, you had something to say. I did. I'm thinking about the rabbit trail you just went down. (laughs) I think um, like marriage is all about serving one another. And yeah, we're not really prepared to serve somebody. We're thinking uh, if, in uh, the message translation, it said, it talks about love inside of marriage is a love marked by giving, not getting. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we're all about like, especially as young teenagers or young twenties, normally it's like, we're stuck in that. Like, what can I get out of this? Not what can I give to this? And yeah. so really learning to die to self. Like, I mean, it, he pretty much unpacked so much of it, but um, I think too, the idea of it being a piece of paper that I feel like that had to have been introduced when it's like, oh, but I can do everything besides the marriage paper by, mm-hmm. you know, having sex, which I mean, years, you know, rewind decades. It's like there was no, you wouldn't have had sex without mm-hmm. it anyways. But so there was a part of the, the waiting process that also our generation, you know, seem older, you know, it's cheesy to call it that, but you know, we've been called like the microwave generation. Like we want everything fast. Like the beauty of waiting for something, Mm, the treasure of saving myself, saving my body, saving my heart, Mm -hmm. saving my mind, saving those certain things that I don't want to expose to anybody because you should be the only person. Like we don't treasure waiting anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and what everything we're portrayed from the media is you can have it all besides the paper. Yeah, You know, it's like, oh, you can just live with them. Oh, you could have their baby. Oh, you could have, I love you but they don't depict all of that pain, heartache, why they're, you know, what the gaps are that we're, they're trying to fill in. Um, so I think the, I, the question is why does it, why would we ever even think it's a paper? Why do, would we yeah. ever think marriage is something that is temporary? Like for us, like it's, 
the divorce word would never even be, it's not allowed, like it's not an option. But I think a lot of ge- our generation is being raised yeah. up where marriage even seems temporary of like, oh, it might be my first, second or third, uh, no mm-hmm. big deal. Um, I'm going to find the right person eventually, or I found my soulmate now. So things like that. Well, and then you get into, you know, the, I mean, the, the question you asked, we could talk about the entire yeah. time, right? <laughs> There's so many layers to this. Yeah. Science and psychology are finally catching up with scripture. Now, as, as we're as we've begun to uncover neuroscience and the things that are going on in the biology of our brains, we've we've begun to understand that in, through sexual intercourse and um, human connection, our brain actually releases chemicals, vasopressin, serotonin, oxytocin. Um, I don't know how much you know about that kind of stuff, but that's huge. When you look at Genesis two twenty four, you look at Matthew nineteen three through nine where he's reiterating what God brings together, let no one separate. The two will become one flesh, where you actually have this melding together. And and in particular, in Matthew 19, he's being questioned on divorce. The Pharisees are saying, Jesus, what do you say about divorce? He's saying, don't get divorced. And the Pharisees are saying, well, Moses let us get divorced if we if we provided a certificate of divorce. He said, well, Moses allowed you to do it because your hearts were hard, but it's not God's design. What God brings together, let no one separate. He then, not only did he give that as an instruction, he said, let me give you the glue to make that happen. Cole, let's use me for an example. You're going to marry Caitlin at 22. And I actually need you to be more committed to her than you are your family that you grew up with for 22 years. Mm -hmm. So let me put oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin. Let me create this chemical concoction of bonding in your brain that causes you to feel bonded and latched to her when you experience a sexual orgasm with her. Now I'm feeling bonded here. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem in our generation, once again, the average male has six sexual partners before they're married, the average woman four and a half. So by the time they've got to the marriage bread, they've had to teach themselves how to not be impacted by the fact they bonded and detached, bonded and detached. So they've had to convince themselves sex is just an act. It's not, there's no meaning to it. And that's a lie that our culture has been telling ourselves to comfort ourselves from the pain that it's not true. It's the, it's the irony that we've lied to ourselves to protect ourselves from that very thing. Mm, And so now all of a sudden we're getting into marriage. We don't know how to have covenant because we've conditioned ourselves to never have covenant. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is a piece of paper unless we have allowed the Lord to renew and restore our understanding of covenant commitment and allowed the literally for those that are listening, stop, even pause this right now and pray that the Lord will reset your neurotransmitters. Amen. That yeah. he will reset your dopamine release, your serotonin release, your vasopressin, your oxytocin. Those are the four main ones that are at play. We, I actually li- literally pray for people, Lord, reset their minds, renew their neurotransmitter chemical releases so that they can bond again the way you had designed them to bond. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. And that is like so important. I never thought about like the physical part of it because we've talked about in our podcast, I know you guys have too, about soul ties um, and processing through that. And so we, d- we did a two-part series on that of God's intention that we would be bonded to another human. Um, what does it look like to break those so that we can enter into marriage in a healthy way? Um, yeah, that's just so great. So we've kind of mentioned it, um, but I would love to dive in a little bit more of why um, why is sex for covenant? Why is it a big deal that it's something that, you know, God is not um, some angry God who hates sex. He actually created it and honors it and wants us to enjoy it, but within the confines of covenant. So can you just kind of talk about to us about that? Why is sex so important and so valuable to be saved for covenant? It's great. Yeah, it is great. I think he kind of did just kind of open it up perfectly of explaining the science behind it. It's like the science is the way God created it. So the idea that God literally made our bodies to enjoy so that we could bond, Mm -hmm. so that we could experience this thing with only one person, the bonding is the why to me. It's like, that's, you know, the bonding, the pleasure, um, the oneness that happens through sex, like that's a huge part of the why. Um, I think. Yeah. Well, I think our, our, our sto- Caitlin and I's stories speak to that question yeah. really well. Caitlin was pretty sexually active before we were together, before she found the Lord. And by, she, she didn't have sexual intercourse, but 
oral sex, countless times, countless guys, did not even know the names of some of them, just to sum up your story, right? Um, I was raised in a Christian home that did a really good job of presenting God as a relationship opportunity, not a religious structure. Um, so it's been my lifelong goal to destroy all religious structures that don't prioritize relationship. Um, but I never looked at pornography. I never been with any woman besides Caitlin, never even said, I love you to any woman besides Caitlin. Hmm. So I think the way that we should answer that is answer from you, the damage of experiencing sexuality, right. not in covenant, babe. Yeah. 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 So for me, experiencing it before it taught my body and my brain and um, my beliefs to like, I attached in these such unhealthy ways. And for me, a lot of my sexual experiences um, as a female, which I know is very common, but not very common to be talked about, is my experiences were often filled with pressure, whether it was social pressure or pressure from the guy in the moment. Mm -hmm. It was this idea that I had to do this. And so that wired my brain to look at him the same as every other guy and think I have to do this. Wow. But um, so there was so much brokenness for me because my body as a young teenage girl, which again is very common to be introduced to this at 13, 14, 15, 16, those formative years where I, my body's going into fight or flight mode every time I'm touched because I actually hate what's happening to me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel safe. I don't, I'm not in covenant. I don't know what this guy wants from me. I don't know what I want from him. I'm thinking this is what everybody does. So I'm here and I'm doing this but I'm hating it. And so it honestly, it trained my body through the trauma of these different moments and back seats and dark movie theaters and really yeah. just sketchy situations to go into this, you know, fight or flight mode of just like, I hate this, protect myself. I'm saying yes, but my body's screaming no. And I, it took me years to unlearn that because then I walk into marriage with this baggage of looking at him the same way I looked at all of those guys, even though his story is he uh, is beginning to share is so different. So I could trust him, but my body was saying I couldn't trust him. Like yeah. I could enjoy this because this is what God gave me to enjoy, but I was incapable of enjoying it because of the way I'd experienced it. And I think that, I mean, just the, the generation where the media that we are just really, it's bombarding our generation every day is doing such a disservice to us because we think this is what enjoying sex would look like we don't understand what de mm -hmm. the design for sex is. Totally. Like it's so perverted yeah. at every angle. It's so objective. Women are so objectified. It's like, we were never meant to see anybody in bed. We were never meant to see yeah. anybody naked. We mm -hmm. were never meant to see booty shaking on the TV. You know, like we were never meant and yeah. designed to see these things. So imagine if we hadn't seen any of that and we had no experiences, like when I've tried to do that and I look at our life and I've definitely had moments where the Lord's redeemed and we've had these special moments where I'm like, this is amazing. Like when he's looking at me and I know I am the only woman who's ever made him feel this way. I am the only yeah. naked body he's ever seen. I'm the only naked body he's ever touched. And when I watch the joy and the pleasure and the bonding that happens, I'm like, this is what the whole world is missing out on because mm -hmm. they don't know, like it's been stolen from them. And so when you get to experience, you're like, oh, this is all it was ever supposed to be. But it's just, it's really, we have to do the work to cut out the perversion, to get free from addictions, to heal from trauma, from past experiences, if you're going into marriage with it. But I, so yeah, I can say from our side of, especially for me, is that, you know, I've obviously done a ton of work to overcome my past, but watching from his perspective, what sex and marriage is, knowing his history is like, it is totally pure. I'm like, this is so amazing. Like that he always says, he's like, I wish I could have had like a brain map on me. Like they can brain map people who are, um, you know, addicted to pornography and things. Mm -hmm. so they have all these studies of what happens in the brain on porn. He's like, I wish they could see my brain to understand what God designed it to be like. And to look yeah. well, and that's the, that's the side of it, you know, doing what we do. I know so many stories, you know, of men that were addicted to pornography or are, their wife doesn't satisfy them. They need to look at porn before they're mm -hmm. together. They put so much pressure on their wife to perform and to create and do these different yeah. things. Um, on my side of it, not having the, this myriad of sexual experiences, I make love with Caitlin and we do it a lot. We do it more than almost anybody I know, to be quite honest with you, just to be, to, to make everybody a little That's uncomfortable. Um, but I get done and I, I, my experience is why would you want a cheap version of this? Mm -hmm. 
I don't want a friends with benefits version of this. I don't want a no strings attached version. I want all of the strings attached that I have attached to you because all of those yeah. strings are amazing. Those connections that up that yeah. the moment when we're done making love and I and, and we're together and I look at her, there is I see her differently and God designed me to see her differently. He cr gave her the ability to give me pleasure in a way no other human is able to give it to me or yeah. supposed to be able to give it to me, right? Yeah. And so in that moment, I th there's a bond, there's a connection that causes me to do irrational things on her behalf. Mm -hmm. Like leave my family and move across the country to be with her, to leave my parents, to leave. Not that everybody has to do that, right? But the Bible mm -hmm. says to leave and to cleave. And so yeah. that's where that comes from. And, and that's, the, that's God's original design. And then the other thing that covenant does is it, it, it instantly debunks all of the lies. Mm. Okay. So when to, to truly be in covenant means this is an unbreakable agreement. Like yeah. I'm with you. Hell and high water. No matter how many dirty socks you leave on the floor. I won't throw out some <laughs> you of your dirty laundry. Uh, no matter, right. No matter what all. No matter how many meals whatever I cook that is. aren't good. Yeah. Well, whatever, whatever it is. Right. And, and there's, there's bigger, those are all trivial yeah, things. There's big mm -hmm. things that, that really do matter in a marriage, right. Yeah. That people need to work on. Um, but no matter, no matter what those are, I'm with you. So, you know, what? She, you know, she never has to feel. She never has to feel like she has to perform sexually yeah. to need to yeah. live up to a video that I saw mm -hmm. or a past experience that I saw. Or, yeah. and, and, and that's one of the things that, that I absolutely hate that the enemy has woven into our society is this idea. I have to be, I have to know what I'm doing when I'm married so I can be good yeah. for my spouse, right? I can't go in without knowing it. You got to test drive the car before mm -hmm. you buy it. That stuff blows my mind that we've bought that lie. Mm -hmm. Because in a healthy, covenant, truly sold out relationship, she never has to live up to anybody else's version of who she's supposed to be. She gets to be fully her in covenant. In covenant, you get to yeah. be exactly who you are, and I'm going to love you and accept you. And you know what? It might drive me nuts sometimes. But you never have to worry about me getting driven nuts, allowing that to create distance here or separation. Covenant creates <laughs> such a safe place yeah. where I'm not living up to the guys she was with before she knew me. She's mm -hmm. not living up to a movie that I've seen accidentally or on purple, whatever it is. We don't have to live up to something. All I'm doing is showing up every day and get, having the freedom to be myself yeah. in the marriage bed, outside of the marriage bed, in communication and everything we're doing. And there's so much safety in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's safety in that that I, that I fear other people don't get to experience. Yeah, that's so good. For me, this, um, this really, um, growing up in more of a religious setting, I understood like the why of purity, but it didn't really connect to my heart until I met Holy Spirit. Um, because I just remember like re receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and understanding that connection. It was like the first time my spirit understood like, oh, like this is why our bodies have orgasms and this is why people desire to be drunk. Like I just finally had this like supernatural revelation of like, yeah. because God created, um, and again, those are two separate things like, you know, um, sexual relations and, and drunkenness, but in the right context, like know that our spirits were actually um, designed for pleasure. Um, we were designed to be intoxicated with love, like by Holy Spirit, like that's what we were created for. And so we kind of talked about that before about like marriage um, showing us God, but in the other way as well as like God in his covenant with us mm -hmm. in his gift and his pleasure of Holy Spirit. Like we were, like we were so designed for pleasure and we were, we've been taught that that's bad, especially in religious circles. Absolutely. We've been taught that like, um, you know, everything is about duty. Everything's about, you know, like, um, even within marriage, even with the sex one is the marriage, we've been taught this lie of like, you know, you just have to do it. This is what married people do, especially this is what wives do. Wives must perform to please. Um, and when pleasure is out of friendship and out of covenant, it's no longer about love. Um, so it's about 
performance. And so you're I know for me, married. I feel like you're ready to be married. You have, <laughs> I receive it insights as a single woman. That's so let's, good. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so we could continue to talk about this. And as we um, continue, I want you guys to be able to give resources, um, for more revolution, to be able to dive into so many topics about sexuality. Um, But I want to kind of continue. So for me as a single person, one of the things that's been so helpful is throughout the seasons, I have intentionally gone after married couples and asked to be put under their wing. Like, can I please hang out with you? Can I please yeah. um, watch you guys argue? Can I please load your dishwasher? Can I, I please- argue in front of anybody. You know, can I, I please put your kids to bed? Um, and so that's been so helpful, but can you kind of give, um, some advice to married couples is how can they be more intentional, um, to seek out singles in their circles and to bring them in and kind of like what that mentorship kind of looks like with single people in their life? Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, it's really about letting people in your life, right? Like we have people that, um, we will just bring them with our stuff that we're doing with our kids and, you know, letting them into those circles. I think obviously creating healthy parameters, you know, like making sure I'm not getting too close to single girls that we're ministering to, or she's not close to single guys. We've always, you know, not that we require this of everybody, but we, we personally don't ride in cars or be in one-on-one scenarios with anybody of the opposite sex, no matter how close we are. Right. Oh, there's yeah. like a daughter to me. She's not actually my daughter though. So we're not going to be in scenarios like that. So there's a good healthy line there. Um, but yeah, I, I think just in general, we can live more vulnerably. Married couples should allow people into their realm. Now, if you have a truly dysfunctional marriage, maybe you should get that fixed before you let <laughs> people in. Um, but I think for us, like, you know, I, I it's probably going to sound prideful. I don't, I don't mean this prideful. We have the best marriage of anybody I know. And I'm not saying that, like, no, I don't know anybody with good marriages. We know tons of people with great marriages. I love what we have, though. Mm-hmm. And so I want people to see what we have. Yeah. Right? So I think that, bringing them, it's super simple and practical, invite them to things. Mm -hmm. Let people into your space, let people come to the things that you don't think that they would come to, that they would want to come to, right? Like come and hang out. I'm doing laundry, but you're welcome to come and sit and talk. Kate's done that, you know, tons of times throughout the years. Yeah, I think that, and like, obviously I'm a woman, so speaking as a woman to girls, like I always just found it important to talk about those types of things, even in ministry training, like we led a ministry training school and I went through a ministry training school and, you know, I was trained on how to study the Bible and how to preach and all these things. I remember thinking like, I need to be trained on how to be a wife and a mom and like, like all of those things too, because they are a mystery. Like I remember thinking I'm single. That is a mystery to me. Like I have no idea how that works and what that looks like. And so just as a wife, being willing to have single women in your circle that you do share things that they know you're an open book that they could ask questions yeah. um and that you do you talk through all of the things I remember telling my friend who is single about like labor and delivery and watching her eyes get big but I'm like this is you know it's just part of sharing life before they're there and she'll get there she's married now so she'll have that moment too but yeah I think just being an open book um but I think what you said of your example of being a single woman and seeking that out intentionally, I think is really important. It's like making your intentions clear of like, Hey, I want to like learn from you guys. I want to be in your life. Um, I think like if some, nobody's ever been that direct with us, we've had people in our life because we've been in ministry. But if somebody said that, I'm like, we would take ownership of like, yeah, we want to like pour into you and that. So I think for single people listening, just knowing, like, just make that clear of like, Hey, I really, I like what I see in your marriage or in your family. Not that I'm assuming it's perfect, but would love to like glean and kind of just learn from being a part of your circle in your life. Yeah. Um, So I want to go back. We're kind of making a full circle here to when we started our conversation about your first year of marriage, how you described that. And like I said, this is the summertime. And so there's a lot of weddings happening. Um, A lot of bikinis and bathing suits happening as well. And that is. Non-wedded folk. Oh my God. That as well. A lot of spray tans. Um, But so for engaged couples right now that might be listening to this, um, you know, they're in starstruck romance and excited to get married. married. Um, What advice do you have for them of saying, hey, like if we could sit down with you and have coffee, this is some advice we would give to you going into marriage. And following up this podcast will be a five day podcast (laughs) on (laughs) dating advice, um, engaged advice. But you want to go first so I don't. Uh, no, you go first. Um, I would say 
just keep asking questions. One of the things I've seen young couples make a mistake of is once they feel like this is the person, they stop asking important questions. And so they stop uncovering things and discovering things and receiving mentorship. And they, they kind of start to shun any advice because well, God said, this is the one. Mm. Okay. God may have said, this is the one, but he didn't say, get stupid now. Yeah. Right. He, 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 they can be the one and you can still get to know them and ask a ton of questions. We, we it's almost like the moments a, a young couple thinks the young individual thinks, Oh, this is the one they stop asking. Okay. But when is this the one for me, Lord, mm-hmm. when does the covenant happen? And that's critical to ask too. Yeah. I've seen a lot of relationships, unfortunately that have ended the marriage has ended because they didn't, work on the right stuff before they got lost in their passion. They got lost in their emotion. They got lost in the romance. They got lost in the word of the Lord. I don't doubt that the Lord said, yeah, you can marry this person. Mm -hmm. Um, I completely debunked the idea of the one, right? The one is whoever you've chosen to be the one in covenant with that. She's the one for me now because I chose to be in covenant with her. Mm -hmm. Um, But you go once, once young people have found that one, um, it, they, they start throwing things out, you know, and I, the best way I could say this is my 10 year old loves, loves, loves baseball. He said, this is my sport. This is it. This is what I want to do. I'm going to be in the MLB. Like you ask him, that's his life goal. He doesn't say I'm going to be a, in the MLB and then do nothing at 10 years old. He's spending two hours a day working on baseball, developing his skills, developing different areas long before he's ever in the place where he would maybe get a college scholarship one day down the road right? Like, so my encouragement is still prepare yourself for that relationship. Even if you think you know everything, you don't know everything. So take some time, get to know each other, work on yourself, work on getting to know each other so that you're not rushing into God's relationship outside of God's timing. Yeah. Um, I would say because most people that are engaged, one or both of you have a past. So I would say go after um, that 100% now. Um, Don't wait, like don't wait, but also don't be discouraged when you're like, I did it all, but there's still messes. Like there will probably still be messes that you won't know until you're married. And you you can't possibly know it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Until you're well into marriage. Yep. But go after it all now, like go to a counselor. Um, I totally had written off a lot of my past because I thought it wasn't that bad. Uh, so don't use that comparison trap of thinking, oh, my story is not that bad. I think if you have any sexual history, if you have any experience with porn um, or just different things that might have happened in childhood, like schedule a session. Like don't mm-hmm. save the money on the china and on the extra flowers oh, on the tables on. at the wedding. You don't need a good wedding. You need a good marriage. Oh, so give, so the, give them yes. to your counselor, <laughs> uh, schedule the counseling now. Don't just, I mean, I this drives me crazy, but premarital counseling is important. We would never marry somebody without it. But beyond premarital counseling, because normally those are volunteer couples in your church, go to a professional counselor yes. if you have a sexual history of any kind and just dig into it. Open it all up, lay it all out, and just see if there's anything that triggers or that hits a root that you're That's like, true. I need to up, like uproot this now so that my marriage doesn't have to pay for it, so that my children and their children don't have to pay Well, and you might need to get delivered of religion, too. Like, we know so many people that are born in religious environments where sex is bad, and so they get married and they can't do it because uh, they they just start melting down. Yep. Um, Mm -hmm. You may need to get married. You go through some healing and some counseling. Even, honestly, it sounds crazy, but deliverance. I know I'm not very popular for saying that, but deliverance from legalism, religion, this, this idea that sex is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sex is a really unbelievably awesome thing. And the quicker you can figure that out, the better your marriage will be. Yeah, I want to share a funny story with you about religion. Um, I don't, this is, I don't know, six years ago or something now. I was at a women's conference and we had time to just kind of hang out with the Lord. And so I was processing some stuff with Jesus and I was like, fine, I'm not getting off of the floor until you talk to me. And so I go and I like, they have these like communion places and all this fancy stuff. And so I'm laying there on the floor and the Lord says, you need to get rid of bitch face. And I was <gasps> like, are you allowed to say that to me? Like, <laughs> like, 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 like what, what is that? And he goes, yeah. He's like, you've used purity as a weapon against men instead of Ooh. as an invitation into God's holiness. And that's not what I created sexuality for. And I was like, oh, okay. He's like, so you've trapped yourself in this high tower and no one can get to you. 
And he's like, this is not okay. And I was like, okay. So then I went to my pastor friend and I was like, Jesus just told me I take bitch face. Like, is he even allowed to say that to me? <laughs> and, and so just unpacking that. And so I love, like, for me, like, I think that's so important because you have the two ends of the spectrum. I'm glad you think that's funny. Um, Feels so of, free right now. <laughs> the Like of religion or whether it's been like, for me, both end, edges of the spectrum are damaging. And so we have to, like, yeah. we have to have God's heart for that. Totally. Um, and so I just want to share that because it's okay. funny. And because I love talking okay. to people because it's like, you're not going to get fired right now. You're not getting fired for saying that on podcasts. No, I'm not going to get fired. I love they listen I to it. I didn't know the Midwest was so good and has come so far. <laughs> yeah, that's I moved to California so I could swear on podcasts. Apparently, I didn't need to. <laughs> I'll, put, I, I'll put a PG-13 on the subtitle for us to make sure it's all good. I already said orgasm and laundry, so PG-13 is good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, one other thing I would say, though, as a recommendation is there's two books we recommend highly for engaged couples. Uh, they both, I would say we probably subscribe to like 95% of the book, but they both have some things we don't agree with 100%. I haven't have read the book, so I don't know. Sheet music. Uh, I can't remember the yeah. author. Is that Kevin Lehman? I and know then, what you're talking um, about, yeah. Intended for Pleasure. Because that one will go into some of the sex stuff that uh, your church might not have taught you if your church has been silent on sex, that you're like, whoa, why did nobody tell us this? Yeah. Um, so that's, those are two good books for preparing for sex and marriage. Love that. And you don't need a great honeymoon. You need a good sex life, and it doesn't get built in the oh, moment. Yes. So if it's not fireworks, the gift is discovery together. So the first night might not be the, feel like the gift. You might be like, this isn't what I waited for. God, you're not blessing me. I waited, and this is what I get. All of that might be what you feel like. But here's the deal. You get to enjoy every part of everything the best you can then, and you're discovering together. You can laugh at when things don't work. You can joke about how things don't work and then you can get excited she's getting it we didn't do it on our honeymoon <laughs> we it just we couldn't get things going yes and we actually had to call our pastor that married us and put him on speakerphone we speaker like, on our what night. do we Help! do it's not fitting i don't know where to go from here fix this oh God, that's funny and so like but everybody we talked to is like they, they put so much pressure on sex on the wedding night mm -hmm. The advice I give to every couple we marry is stop putting so much pressure to have good sex on the wedding night or the honeymoon. You probably won't. So get rid of that weight mm -hmm. so that you can actually get to know each other and enjoy each other. And guess what? You got 70 freaking years to figure it out. You don't need to know how to do everything on night one. Give yourself time to learn, to discover, and to journey together in it. And that's what we have done. We've discovered some wonderful things. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for your conversation as we kind of close up today. Um, for all of our listeners, if you've enjoyed this conversation, um, I want you to go over to morerevolution.com and check it out. But before we head out, for the people that have not heard of More Revolution, can you kind of just tell us a little bit about what you guys do and what More Revolution is? We're doing it right now. Yes, Moral Revolution is all about God's design for sexuality, uh, raising the conversation in churches and homes. We equip parents. We have lots of things for single people, uh, single dating. We have books, websites, podcasts. What else? Resources, yes. e-courses, e events. Yep. Um, basically. Anything about sexuality. Yeah, trying to disrupt and dismantle the enemy's distortion of what sex is meant to be and restore it to God's design um, and equip the church and inspire people to e experience a better and deeper, more intimate God-designed experience of relationship and sex. That's us. That's it. Worldrevolution.com. <laughs> Um, for our, if you listened last week on the podcast, I talked about my favorite more revolution resource, which is the intimacy ladder. Hey, um, and so, so, so good. And so this is your second reminder. If you haven't listened to it, go and listen to it. Um, we will right. again put that in the show notes with all of the information. Um, but if people would love to connect with you, how can they find you online? Instagram is kind of where we live, Moral Revolution. I don't on live on Instagram. I live in my house. I mean, it's where Moral Revolution lives, not where yes. we live. Um, but we're also on Facebook. I think we're on Twitter, but mainly Instagram, Facebook, and then um, podcasts, podcasts, you Spotify, can follow in, YouTube uh, us channel. personally on Instagram. I'm sure I'll let you down. I post a bad picture once a month. Caitlin's Instagram might fulfill your Instagramming needs more than mine would. <laughs> 
so fun. In my line, Mm-mm. I post a bad picture once a month. I get I used to get ridiculed for my bad pictures. Now she just accepts them. Yeah, it's part of part of the package. Mm-hmm. It's part Great. of the package. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for being on the podcast today. I appreciate just your transparency and the wisdom that you carry. Um, and so, as we close today, would you guys pray for our listeners? Mm-mm. Go. He's like, nope, not doing it. Fine. <laughs> Fine, we'll pray, I guess. You want me to pray? Yeah, you pray. Why don't you want to? I can pray after you. All right. Um, man, Father, we we do thank you for this moment. I thank you. Um, man, first of all, just thank you for what Bridget is building and the things that she is going after. I can only imagine, even in a great church, in the Midwest, I can only imagine the religious or legalistic structures that she's destroying in her pursuit of openness and vulnerability, the things she's had to rebuild in her own mind and her heart. And I just thank you for that. I bless her. Um, I ask just for covering protection around her as she's creating this environment that she's fighting for freedom in. I pray and, and even speak this into existence that she will see powerful, profound, revelation and freedom, deep freedom that comes from the ministry that she's leading and the, the things that she's doing in these, these podcasts and, and all of the things that she's forging in her church and in her environment, that there would be supernatural stories of freedom that come as she is breaking down religious structures that the enemies tried to create. Pray for significant freedom. Uh, for everybody that's listening, wherever they're at, I pray that same prayer for them, actually, that there would be beautiful freedom in marriages, beautiful freedom in in engagements, beautiful freedom in single relationships, where they are stripped down of all of the mentalities, the mindset, the paradigm that's been built built into their mind, and they would begin to experience and see the real, true, free picture that you have designed for marriage, that the enemy wouldn't get to steal the definition but that you would restore the definition of what marriage is and what you designed and intended for marriage to be. Lord, we pray for all the single people. I pray that hope would be filled in their hearts today after hearing this, God, that they would have hope for a meaningful marriage, marriage that is more than a piece of paper, marriage that is covenant, God, that there would be hope in their hearts about covenant, that they would be so pumped up right now about what you have for them um, if you've called them to marriage. And then, God, we pray for every listener that is married. I just pray, God, that they would have this... um, this urgency or this this passion to share about the beauty of marriage because we are not going to win the narrative that marriage is good and that marriage is the way without with with hiding with shrinking back or with only complaining here and there and nagging about marriage but god that we would tell the world a better story about marriage not that it's perfect but that it's beautiful that it's covenant, that it's safe, that it's how you designed it, God. Mm -hmm. And God, I also pray that they would have a passion to go make some amazing love that is bonded and beautiful, God. That if they have an unhealthy or broken sex life, God, that it would get healed up. It would get, um, it's healed and holy, God, in their bedroom, God, that anything that would try to come in and divide in their marriage, whether it's in their minds or in their bedroom, God, we just pray for a division to be gone, unity inside of marriages, mm-hmm. healing and restoration inside of marriages, um, just to shine a beautiful picture of the covenant that you've called us to with you and with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks for listening to Tuesday Talks with Shawnee Alliance Church. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a review and be sure to subscribe, rate, and share. If you would like to join our conversation on social media, be sure to use the hashtag Tuesday Talks with SAC. Thanks for listening to this week's episode, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.